Uh, Michael, given what we just said from Wayne regarding having to take that view to the future regarding what the world might look like, what we may be doing to cope with a pathogen in our midst that shouldn't stop us from in some way making progress with our, our economy, our various forms of business enterprise, etc. How do you think we should be looking to prepare for that shift which is likely to happen if we do not have the benefits of success with our physical distancing and without a virus that will give us that shield of immunity, etc. Right. So, I mean, th this question is, is quite important and I think it builds upon a lot of the comments that were made before because, you know, it's looking to the future. Now, with every opportunity that presents itself, the, the people who are being impacted need to be ready to embrace these opportunities, okay? So it means that whatever, however, um, whatever model that will be post COVID or with COVID moving forward, it needs to be an environment where if we are using technology in whatever way that we're using technology, the people who is impacting all the stakeholders need to be ready and keep with the capability necessary to embrace those technologies so that they can do their, their, their work, their job, they can live, okay? And generate value in whatever it is they do. Michael? Sorry to interrupt you. Is that strictly yeah. true? Because COVID arrived and you could argue that we weren't, we weren't ready. We just had to adapt and to react. Yes, but we're looking long-term, right? So we're looking, let's say next year, maybe end of next year or something. We, we see that the COVID is still around or COVID has been eradicated. I, I don't know. But when COVID hit, we were unprepared in terms of, I mean, it, it, it came and then we went into lockdowns and people we needed to scramble to work from home, schooling from home and so on. Tomorrow, it's going to be, okay, this stuff is there. We have the learnings of what has happened before. We know that if this is going to change, as one of the, for example, an impact this could have on the, on the Caribbean is that we know that our economies are based largely on things like tourism, agriculture, and so on. Tourism is being decimated now with, with, uh, with COVID. How can we look to see, are there opportunities with technology that we can replace this industry, right? But this is an opportunity that the people need to be, that will be impacted by this opportunity, need to be ready to embrace the technologies that will take them to the next step. And that, that's the point I wanted to make. Maybe I didn't articulate it in the right way. So, so, so that's the first thing. And then next to that, we have to, so that, that's how I see it in, in terms of being ready for the, for the opportunities. And then I think the time is now for, for us the, and, and the leaders of the countries, the political leaders and so on, to start thinking about how, what will our economies look like and what do we need to start doing now? so that we can embrace this change. Okay, you, you have some of these countries using these tactics like, okay, we wanna bring in um, the tourists and the work for six months here and okay, it gives them some revenue and, and whatnot. That's great. But if we want to something that's sustainable and long-term, we need to start thinking now as to how do we want to transform some of these industries using the technologies, maybe embracing different technologies and really, could we be, could we foresee, for example, we create these IT bubbles where um, we have people who learn uh, more about technology, about coding, about, I don't know, different things, so that, um, let's say, US companies don't have to go to India anymore, but maybe can come to the Caribbean. I don't know, just, you know, an, an idea. Could it be that we look to see how we can use uh, different technologies to develop our own industries, maybe fisheries, maybe, um, you know, so the, this presents itself a host of opportunities for us to rethink how uh, we work today and to 
explore these opportunities of tomorrow. But we have to be ready as a people to embrace it. And as Nick was saying, okay, maybe sometimes there isn't the, the infrastructure in terms of IT infrastructure and so on. Maybe the political will is not there um, for these things to happen. Um, maybe the education, maybe the, the level of um, readiness to embrace the technology is not there. And these things probably need to all come together for these, that to happen. Uh, and that, that's my thoughts on this. And looking at the role of STEM in helping us get to that particular point where Nick made the point, we've been on this yeah. call for over an hour and I think we've had a fairly decent quality of service in terms of the yeah. connection. Yeah. I've been able to hear and see everyone quite, quite well. So I think the technology, if I could be so bold, gets a pass, it gets a passing grade. The technology seems to be ready. Yeah. Are we ready to adopt the workforce shift that's needed? I think largely, yes, because we have to do so right now. Yeah. Whether it's in terms of the patterns of staffing for work to happen, yeah. or even having shifts in the schools where the form ones are here one day, the next day the form twos, et cetera. Oh, yeah. Do we want to wholeheartedly embrace those and continue with them even after we've seen the back of COVID? I think it would be a one way for us to start focusing on whether that future state, we will be happy with it, that we'll be actually taking advantage of those opportunities and looking at minimizing the risks. Um, so, Lindo, so, just to let you know, we've got Derek on the, on the call as well. Um, Derek hasn't actually made a contribution, so at some point we want to invite him to make a contribution. Yeah. Absolutely. Welcome, Derek. Thank you, Fred. Michael, could we yeah, have so, after Fred. Yeah, so I think you, you, you're quite right. We today have been, I mean, with, with COVID, we have been, we have this opportunity or we faced with it and it's presented challenges where we've had to um, step up. Now, if we look at, and, and this is my view here, if we look at education itself, that's one thing. And I think the path education will take, because education in terms of how we do um, in the Caribbean and so on, it's, I think it, it will continue on a path and that will grow with the lessons of, uh, as you know, how we develop with the distance learning, maybe you in integrating technology into education will grow. Uh, it will be step by step, but it will grow and it will develop. I think the, the biggest changes or the ones that will have more impact on our development as a country and, and region in the Caribbean will be how do we use these technologies for uh, business development and for creating values, okay? And here, I think where, if it goes back to your question, where STEM can, can, can play a role is to really lobby our government leaders, maybe, I don't know if lobby is the right word, but really um, encourage them to drive the change. Because on the one hand, and, and I would say this, I mean, I've, I've been in St. Lucia recently, well, not recently, recently, but in, in January, uh, February this year. And, while we talk about, um, yes, we have the technology, there's still a big disparity between the people who have access to technology and so on, and a lot of people who do not. And part of that will be, okay, how do we get universal coverage of technology, maybe internet access, maybe giving access to education, to different things, so that as a people, we are ready with the tools to embrace these opportunities. And, and part of that for me has to be with how can we as STEM get our political leaders to push in these areas, to look at the opportunities, envision what could our region be in um, 2025, 2030. Based on that, build the road back. Let's start looking together with our political leaders and with STEM, how do we integrate technology, the sciences, the mathematics into that roadmap? Using the, um, 
technologies uh, you know that, that that have been available so that we can grow and we can leverage uh, what's already there That's, these are my comments interesting Derek I noticed you've been waiting patiently to get a uh, word in please thanks a lot uh, and thanks for the invitation tonight you're welcome. Um, I apologize for not sharing my video but I, I Honestly, forgot that we were doing this tonight, so that's okay. Um, I wasn't a hundred percent prepared, but I wanted to take off from Michael's point um, on, on in two directions. The first is that I'm a career technologist, and uh, my bias is always towards entrepreneurship. Um, to my mind, technology is one of the few areas uh, where we do not need to rely on government policy to drive the initiative or to take the initiative. Um, <clears throat> we have now reached, as, as I think the group has, uh, has said, or we seem to have reached a consensus that the technology is ready. All right. Um, it took us a long time to get here in terms of internet penetration, in terms of cellular penetration and so on. But I think the numbers would show that, you know, many Caribbean people have internet access and most have mobile phones. All right. So it means that the, the baseline technology is there for a certain level of service. Um, in terms of how to drive that entrepreneurship, I think it needs to be driven on two ends. The first thing is we need to create ecosystems and we can do this um, as Caribbean academics, as you know, entrepreneurs, as um, business leaders, create environments where, or ecosystems where technology and technologists can thrive. And when I say create an ecosystem, what I mean is what is needed is community of technologists that actually collaborate, All right? If you, if you think, for example, of the power of the iTunes platform and or Google's platform or what have you, the power of these platforms is that they provide the basic tools that can be reconfigured in a number of ways to provide novel services. The issue that we have as technologists is that many of us have preferences for which tools we use and we're running in a hundred different directions without you know, some baseline, some ecosystem that holds us together, holds the whole thing together, right? So that's one thing, creating that ecosystem. The second thing is I think that when you're talking about uh, technology in the Caribbean, we have to start looking at technologies that, that touch every individual. So very, very basic things. I mean, we've been waiting for, for a long time for internet banking and, and different things. Um, are there novel solutions to that? You know, with the advent of, black, of blockchain, do we have the wherewithal to, um, to create a network that, that connects not only banks, but credit unions, um, you know, formal money lenders and, and different, uh, different stakeholders within that ecosystem, right? Um, this is something that can be driven um, sort of from the ground up rather than from the, from the policy level. Right. And the final right. thing that I'll share is this. <clears throat> The, whenever you're talking entrepreneurship, you learn very early that you must have an exit strategy, right? And the exit strategy typically has to do with scale, all right, where technology is concerned. <clears throat> um, I believe that we should be looking at economies like ours that have similar challenges and where our solutions 
would find ready adoption. All right, and, and when, I, when I say this, I'm thinking of equatorial regions, um, post-colonial societies and so on, um, that have the same struggles that we have. All right, um, one of them being um, original, you know, ownership of IP, um, you know, this precious little bit of that, um, you know, across, you know, our type of, within our type of experience, right? So if it's produced in one area, I feel strongly that it could be sold in others, you know, for part equity or whatever the equation ends up being. So I think uh, this is pretty much uh, what I, what I wanted to contribute tonight. Thank you for those thoughts, Derek. Your perspectives for a while mirrored some of the comments that we heard from Michael about having an IT bubble and basically not reinventing the wheel in terms of learning from what experience elsewhere was beneficial and maybe adopting those. I think we are coming close to our end time. Time so flies when we are in the midst of this discussion. It does, it does fly by. Yes, it uh, does. Yeah, can I, can I just say something before we, if, if, if we're gonna bring it to a close um, shortly. I, I, sort of, I guess as an urban yeah. planner, sometimes I sort of try to look at what, you know, where, what, are, what are the challenges and what, what solutions do we need to sort of, um, you know, uh, sort of uh, implement. Um, and so one of the things that I'm, so some of the things that I look at, like in the Caribbean, for example, what we've seen in the UK and other parts of the world is that online shopping, for example, um, is one of these areas that have, we have seen a, a significant increase. Um, and so the question for me is, are we in the Caribbean set up, you know, to exploit um, online shopping? Uh, you know, even like in the United States, like, you know, bars, um, you know, and restaurants, you know, are set up to, so they could continue operating because they've got the facilities in place where, you know, people could order and then, you know, make deliveries, but you have to have the, uh, you know, the, the logistics uh, chains, you know, the, um, you know, set up to be able to do that. I mean, you know, things like, which was mentioned just, you know, a few minutes ago by Derek, like, um, you know, digital and, uh, you know, contactless, you know, payment, for example. So businesses, need to move to sort of setting up, you know, the, or having, you know, the, the facilities in place to be able to, uh, to exploit, um, you know, these, uh, you know, these opportunities that present themselves. The demand is there. It's just that people can't actually go out to the businesses. So have, you know, uh, that sort of thing, you know, ensure that this is in place. And if, uh, you know, and if I was a business, this is where I would sort of, you know, look to like, in, in, you know, in, in moving towards in, in increasing, making a connection with a customer uh, you know, in, in such a way that I can actually home deliver stuff to people um, and keep my business going. I mean, remote working, we know is here. Um, again, I don't know, there needs to be sort of maybe changes to legislation and Nick mentioned about culture in the Caribbean to make this happen. Um, so I'll just go through like a couple of points that I made. Distance learning, for example, I don't know how Wayne on the on the university side, you know, what, how, what, what are the universities doing to uh, you know, promote greater distance learning. So, you know, I suppose a lot of students are not now flying out to the universities uh, to be on the site, physically on the site. So are, are the universities expanding the business um, in that area? And does that mean greater access to a lot of students, uh, you know, in, in the Caribbean who would not otherwise be able to go to these places? Artificial intelligence in like, you know, healthcare, for example, you know, other health services looking at sort of like being able to make contact with, you know, like um, people at home who don't need to leave their house to go to a medical center, but being able to have some, maybe someone, some professional who is also using technology to be able to diagnose people um, without them necessarily leaving their home. Um, you know, I'll stop there, but just, you know, a couple of points on, on where things can possibly go, you know, um, and the importance of digital readiness and Nick, as you know, Nick mentioned, and I think other people, you know, touched on as well. We would need to ensure that we have the communications technology in place that allows us to be able to, you know, um, you know, to be able to inhabit that sort of vision of, of tomorrow. Thanks for those thoughts, Fred, on the need for greater access and distance uh, learning, the implications there, and the telehealth um, direction and the use of AI in healthcare. 
closing words, Nick? I see your uh, hand is I was up. Gonna, I wasn't going to close. I wanted to um, add to what Derek said and um, related to some of the things Fred said. So I agree with a lot of what Derek said. I would just add that not only can, I, I definitely think that we should be creating products and services that uh, can be sold to other markets, such as other similar societies to ours, but we can also learn from them. With regard to some of the things that um, Fred said, with regard to um, banking, telecommuting, selling, there are a number of people in, and companies in the Caribbean who have been tackling some of these problems. But from a business point of view, I'd like to add that first that solutions should be fit to the environment and the market, right? So you don't just, you're not gonna sell a product if what you're doing is just try to copy someone else and it must be fit for purpose in that market. So for example, when people in the Caribbean started businesses which allowed shipping from places like Miami next day to the Caribbean, that's, that's a, that's a solution that's definitely fit for our market, right? And when countries like in Africa, when you provide short-term loans for people in that area, when you don't get fines in the bank, these are solutions with us, which are created specific for the market. So the same thing I think must happen in the Caribbean. It's not just about saying that, that um, there is online banking there. We have problems with banking in the Caribbean. We don't necessarily have to follow the exact model that developed countries follow we can create our own solutions. We can maybe copy solutions from other places which aren't definite, aren't necessary, developed, developing developed world come countries, right? So we can create other solutions and we can make use of other solutions, but we must have solutions which are specific to our countries. Otherwise people won't, otherwise people won't, 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 won't use them. Yeah, yeah. But I think that's, that's, that's key, among Definitely. other things, right? Yeah, um, um, I want to acknowledge um, Linus Rogers on um, on the call. Uh, I, I, I hadn't seen you, sorry, but um, Lindell, if you don't mind, we should uh, acknowledge um, Linus and invite a, um, a contribution. By all means. Okay, good night, folks. And my apologies for joining late. So I am Linus. totally out. So you'll have to brief me because I'm, I, I joined late. I, had a, some, I got a, a call from abroad and I was on it, so I came in quite late. So I'm trying. I'm just trying to fit into what I was hearing. I only came in in the last five minutes. Okay. Well, there's uh, quite a lot covered, but it, essentially the question is, you know, I suppose where, where do we see STEM in, you know, like in the Caribbean in a post, you know, COVID world? Um, and there's been lots of discussions around some of the uh, changes that we need to make, um, you know, in terms of, you know, the uh, sort of infrastructure, like communications infrastructure, where the opportunities lie, um, you know, and, and able to. In terms of being able to exploit, um, you know, uh, the the opportunities that we, the challenges that we face now, but also um, we could see these as sort of you know opportunities. And there are some discussions about sort of online shopping, and I think we had quite extensive discussions about um, teaching as well, um, uh, online teaching, um, some of the issues that 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 kids would face with online teaching, but 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 how we could sort of address some of these. Um, Nick made some points about sort of businesses needing to adapt um you know uh so yeah i don't remember everything that we've covered but quite mm -hmm. a lot over the over the hour and 15 minutes mm -hmm. and just yeah. adding to that there was a key point made that we don't always need to wait for the shift to happen at from the government level that private enterprise has a role to play in choosing the tools that work best for them and maybe causing a shift from the bottom up as well so I'd like to thank Nick for the example he shared with us regarding being invested in homegrown technologies that may be better fit for purpose. And I think Nick referred to the MPSA example where financing was taking place in, in Africa and that worked really well for them. Anyone else would care to share some closing um, arguments? with us. I'll pick on Michael. <laughs> Thank you, Lynn. Um, so first, I think that this, and, and this maybe to, to, to conclude, um, the, the opportunity that we have here to share our ideas, thoughts, and opinions um, is what would be the catalyst 
for, for us to take the next steps and to move STEM to bringing, having an impact in the um, Caribbean. Um, I think we should continue uh, with this. I, I enjoy being part of it and sharing um, my experience, my views and so on. Um, it's been a very engaging time for me and I hope that, uh, yeah, we will have the opportunity to do this again. So um, thank you for having me, um, Linda, Fred, Nicholas, and um, yeah, I hope that we have the opportunity again. Thank you, Michael. You'd be more than welcome to attend all of the uh, the Caris um, webinars. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> okay. We have your number. Thank you. Uh, Derek, any closing comments from you? Well, I do want to. I want to echo those sentiments. I think that conversations like these um, need to happen. I think that. Um, you are seeing a groundswell of, of activity of this sort uh, where, you know, COVID has made it very clear how vulnerable we are as a region. And I'm happy to see, you know, this type of reaction taking place. Let's keep it going. Thank you, Derek. It sounds like you've been witnessing the work of the catalyst that Michael commented <laughs> on earlier. Hopefully that continues. When I'm sure you've got something you'd like to share with us in closing. Well, certainly, um, the whole COVID pandemic has, has two kinds of effects that are relevant to us. The first is that um, there is a set of ways that various STEM tools, whether in the biological sciences or information technology or um, or other areas help us to deal with the pandemic. The, the other thing is that it has created an urgency about dealing with the issues that we have been dragging our feet, the societal and um, economic issues that we have been dragging our feet on in the region for decades. It just provides an urgency, and that urgency provides an opportunity for us to look at where we want to go and um, the various tools, and STEM provides a number of these tools, but the various tools that can be used for, to get us there. There are two dangers that, that we have. One is that um, we do nothing. The second is that we use the opportunity and we use the resources to reconfigure other ways of doing the old things, which either were not, success, not as successful as they should have been or have been rendered irrelevant by the changes that this brings about. The more powerful thing is to use this as an opportunity to question the old ways, to determine what actually is relevant and to determine what tools exist to, um, to operate in that, 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 that environment of relevance and to perceive what the new opportunities are, what the new realities are, what the new modalities are, what the new threats are, and what is the suite of tools and the set of capabilities that we can marshal to address this. And this is not a STEM issue, this is a societal issue. However, STEM provides a number of tools which when the society gets itself in gear, it can use to address them. Absolutely. And those of us in STEM are not outside of society. We are part of that society. Thank you for those wise and well-chosen words, Wayne. You've given us a lot to think about. John, would you like to share any uh, closing thoughts with us? Yeah, so in, in summary, uh, basically, 
definitely this pandemic has given us, um, and from STEM perspective, given us a great opportunity to be innovative and um, create and create new markets and and strengthen existing markets. And you, you, if you look at if you across the board, you see that those institutions and countries that were that where uh, rapid innovation was already part of their their DNA, they seem to have um, you know adapted much better compared to other institutions, other countries, and so on. So it's a great opportunity for us um, to like, kickstart if you know if we have been the touch before. But then on, on the other hand, too, I am I am a bit skeptical, a bit cynical because uh, you know we have had past uh, calamities and how our institutions and how our civilization has responded to those things doesn't give me much hope that. Um, maybe in the short term, fine, but in the medium term, that we don't, uh, but, you know, we need to really, this one thing, I mean, you need to incorporate that idea of res resilience and sustainability in the long term. So that, I think, is still remains a challenge for us. So that's, that's, that's what I would like to close off with. Thank you, John. Those themes of resilience, certainly, I agree with you. And your comments regarding having to get to a stage where we have innovation basically written in our DNA. It takes us to the comment that was made by Wayne, where he saw the increasing relevance of uh, bioscience, maybe bioinformatics and information technology as subjects, as areas of study that have particular relevance now, and which as subjects which fall within the STEM areas might well prove to be uh, areas that might spur for the interest within this field. Closing off for us tonight, I think we have Nick. Would you like to share some uh, closing words with us on this very interesting um, topic this evening? Well, um, uh, I got a lot of interesting um, insights from a few people, I must say. Um, the ideas on education and um, technology. One thing I want, some of the topics I would have liked us to have hit on, and we maybe should do it at a, on another data, STEM and uh, the environment. I think we didn't really hit on that. And the natural sciences. Uh, these were the two areas I think we could have done a little more on. And maybe just be the bias of the participants, like me, engineers. But I, in general, I enjoyed it, and I think it was a good discussion. And I think we need more discussions and things like this. So I think it was a it was a good event. And I look forward to the future. So thanks. That's and, right. and, and can I just promote the uh, next event, which is on the 25th of November, and it's on um, it's the Internet of Things in the Caribbean. And that one will be hosted by Nicholas. Um, it, it, do you have a co host or is just just you hosting? But turn up for the event, it'll be another sort of, you know, insightful conversation um, with, with us on the 25th of November, sorry. Absolutely, thank you, Fred. So our next event to reiterate is on Wednesday, the 25th of November. It's on the Internet of Things in the Caribbean, and that promises to be a very